I love Flannery O'Connor, and I recommend her all the time, especially to my Christian friends. She wrote two novels, but it's her short stories that I enjoy so much. Like I said, I always recommend her, but I don't think too many people take me up on my recommendation. I get it, we have busy lives. So I am going to make it easy for you to read her stories and to understand what's going on in them and to know why I'm so excited about them. I'll read the stories out loud and then I'll stop to comment on them now and again and offer some analysis. My plan is to do three stories. After that, I'm sure you will be hooked and you'll want to read the rest on your own. But before we get into the stories, we need to do some foundational work. I'd like to give you a quick bio of Flannery O'Connor and run down the main features of her writing. And last, we need to talk about racism. Some of her characters use the N word and we need to talk about that. I'd like to take the time also to convince you why I think every Christian should read Flannery O'Connor. But I think the best argument for that is listening to the first story. Listen to the whole thing and then you'll know why. First, who was Flannery O'Connor? She was born on March 25, 1925 in Savannah, Georgia. She was a devout Catholic and I mean really grounded in faith. She was very thoughtful about the intersection of faith and life. She seems to be delighted in the quirkiness of people, but she was also critical. She critiques foundational beliefs of both believers and unbelievers. This is one of the reasons why I love her so much. Her work can help us look at ourselves and the way we think about reality and religion and Jesus. And she might be able to help us get more of it right. O'Connor's education included studies at the Peabody High School and Georgia State College for Women, which is now Georgia College and State University. She later earned her MFA from the prestigious Iowa Writers' Workshop. In the middle of all that, she was diagnosed with lupus. It's a chronic autoimmune disease. The disease would cut her life short at the age of 39. She spent much of her life in Milledgeville, Georgia, where she lived on her family's farm. She loved to raise peafowl. O'Connor's writing career gained momentum in the 1950s with the publication of her first novel, Wise Blood, in 1952. Her short stories were regularly featured in publications such as The Sewanee Review and New World Writing. Her short story collection, A Good Man is Hard to Find, was published in 1955, and this book solidified her reputation as a master of the short story form. She died on August 3, 1964. So she had a relatively brief career, and because of her condition, she could only write three hours a day. But she ended up writing two novels and 32 incredible short stories. But the short stories are the real gems, in my humble opinion. But I love it all. And it's not just me that thinks so. Her work has been read under shade trees and taught in universities for many decades. I like to overstate things to make a point, and Flannery O'Connor does that too. <laughs> She once said, to the heart of hearing, you shout. And for the almost blind, you draw large, startling figures. That's one of the things I like about her. So let's talk about some of the characteristics of her fiction. What are the main characteristics of Flannery O'Connor's short stories? Well, they are often violent. One of her protagonists is shot to death by a serial killer. Another is gored by a bull. One drowns in a baptism. Another, when a tractor he's working on, drops on top of him. So why does O'Connor have so much violence in her stories? O'Connor says that, I have found that violence is strangely capable of returning my characters to reality and preparing them to accept their moment of grace. Their heads are so hard that almost nothing else will work. And this leads us to another characteristic of her short fiction, redemption, or an opportunity for redemption. In her stories, the mysterious workings of divine grace are always at work, and many of her protagonists experience a moment when grace is offered, but they don't always receive it by their own choice. O'Connor says that all human nature vigorously resists grace because grace changes us, and change is painful. What's cool about these moments is that they are moments of grace for the reader as well. Another characteristic of Flannery O'Connor's short stories is the grotesque. Grotesque means distorted or twisted or deformed, and, this is important, the grotesque both intrigues us and repulses us. O'Connor's characters are often grotesque characters. They appear more or less normal, but they possess psychological or physical deformities. And this grotesqueness then emphasizes the flawed nature that is in all of us. O'Connor says this, I have to make the reader feel in his bones, if nowhere else, that something is going on here that counts. Distortion in this case is an instrument. Exaggeration has a purpose. And the whole structure of the story or novel has been made what it is because of belief. This is not the kind of distortion that destroys. It is the kind that reveals, or should reveal. Another characteristic of O'Connor's writing is the one I love. Her stories are funny. Well, they're darkly funny. She masterfully blends the comic and the tragic. This humor serves as a tool to highlight the absurdities and the contradictions of human behavior. 
The last characteristic I'd like to talk about is her narrators. I love her narrators. They are usually third-person narrators. We have been told in our English classes that we shouldn't trust first-person narrators, and that we need to look out for dramatic irony and such. We've also been taught that we can generally trust third-person narrators. And this is true, you usually can, but not those of Flannery O'Connor. Their attitudes sometimes slip into alignment with the twisted attitudes of the protagonist. They start to channel the main character. There's so much more to talk about in her writing, but let's stop there. So now we need to deal with the question of racism and the use of the N-word. Was Flannery O'Connor a racist? People have been asking this question since 1970. Her stories contain the N-word. That's what some of her white characters call the characters of African descent. Some of her characters are explicitly racist. There is little doubt that the author is very critical of these characters and their racism. You will see this pretty clearly in the first story that we read. Sometimes the characters are less explicitly racist, but they still use the N-word. By their way of thinking, it's mostly a descriptive term. It's their name for people of African descent. They wouldn't understand it as a manifestation of a deeper racist framework that permeates their culture and their thinking. And it's clear that O'Connor is critical of those attitudes. But there are some pretty racist passages in her letters as well. Not a lot, but they're certainly there. So what are we to do with this? We might say that she was a creature of her time and that's just how people thought back then. And yes, that's true. But there were a lot of white people who didn't think that way at the time. So this defense of O'Connor goes only so far. It seems that she was aware of her racist ideas and wrestled with them. O'Connor once identified with one of her characters, Ruby Turpin. She's the main character in Revelation, the first story we're going to read together. Mrs. Turpin is a piece of work. She was bigoted and racist and a bunch of other things. She doesn't come off well in the story at all, and O'Connor rakes her through the coals. That O'Connor draws a parallel between herself and Mrs. Turpin tells me that the author is aware of her racism, and she was wrestling with it not just on a personal level, but on a moral and spiritual level as well. But I feel unqualified to have the last word on the stories of Flannery O'Connor when it comes to the use of the N-word by her characters. I look to others who have a lot more authority on this subject. Alice Walker was the first woman of African descent to win the Pulitzer Prize for fiction with her book, The Color Purple. In 1975, Walker wrote this about O'Connor's work. Essential O'Connor is not about racism at all, which is why it is so refreshing, coming as it does out of such a racial culture. If it can be said to be about any Anything, then it is about prophets and prophecy, about revelation, and about the impact of supernatural grace on human beings who don't have a chance of spiritual growth without it. She destroyed the last vestiges of sentimentality in white Southern fiction. She caused white women to look ridiculous on pedestals, and she approached her black characters as a mature artist with unusual humility and restraint. She also cast spells and worked magic with a written word. The magic the wit and the mystery of Flannery O'Connor I know I will always love. And Toni Morrison, author of The Beloved, apparently said, There's a woman I love. She's really hostile. Flannery O'Connor. She's really, really good. I take my lead from Alice Walker and Toni Morrison. If these two don't have a problem with Flannery O'Connor's work, then maybe we can read these stories and wrestle with the challenges contained within them. Challenges to our own bigotry and sentimentalism and putting God into our boxes and many other things that distort our view of the world. Back when and where these characters were created, you would have heard the N-word every day of your life. And people didn't even think about it. And that's why they're in the stories. But we live in a different world now, and that word is packed with meaning. In a sense, it's too packed. On the one hand, I would like you to experience the text as written. On the other hand, I want people to experience the richness of Flannery O'Connor's stories, and if the language gets in the way of that experience, then I will have failed. So I've decided that you will neither hear nor read the n-word in my videos as we read O'Connor's stories. But you will know where they go, so be warned. But for those who can and will, watch these videos. You are in for a treat. You're going to love it because she's such an incredible storyteller and just a delight to read. If you are a pastor, you're going to love Flannery O'Connor because her stories are packed full of wonderful sermon illustrations. Tim Keller referenced her regularly. If you are a regular, plain old, ordinary Christian, you should read Flannery O'Connor because she will likely reveal and challenge and convict you on some things that you need to be challenged and convicted on. But she doesn't just challenge Christians. She also challenges those who reject God's grace for reasons that they may not have thought through adequately. So join me in my next video as I do a somewhat close reading of Flannery O'Connor's Revelation. Thank you, and we'll see you there.